Dear Church, good morning. On the front of your bulletin today, there is a little guide for the sermon if you want to remember the main points. Uh, There's some blanks to fill in there, so if you have one of those, feel free to use that. And we find ourselves, once again, in election season in our country, and so we're being asked all year long um, from from politicians for our support, uh, by which, of course, they mean our vote and maybe even our money. I have no interest in talking about politics uh, this morning or even this year, Uh, But I do want us to think about support and the importance of support, and especially today, support that that makes a difference. God in Scripture calls us to be supportive, to support one another. Uh, In fact, the Bible says that that is part of the law of Christ. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, writes this, he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Also, in Romans chapter 15, verse 1, Paul writes, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, he writes, we urge you, brothers, Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. This really goes along perfectly with our theme that we're working on this year of pure religion from James chapter 1. There specifically, James talks about supporting widows and supporting those without families But this idea goes right along with that, and it goes along with the workshop that we will host the first weekend of August later this year, Living with Loss. Part of the benefit of that will be preparing us to be better supporters, better helpers to those who are dealing with loss in their lives. This is just a basic part of being a loving person, of being a godly person, to support those who need support. It is, after all, the the way that Jesus lived his life while he was on this earth, always supporting those in need, never turning a, a deaf ear to someone's cries for help. I remember about him, don't you, that that he supported some friends who had lost their brother who had died. I recall our Lord supporting a disciple who had forsaken him. I think of times when Jesus had compassion for an entire crowd of people because they appeared to him to be like sheep without a shepherd. That is, they had no support. And I remember the scene at the cross when by all outward appearances, Jesus was the one who needed support. And yet he had been abandoned by most everybody. But Jesus from the cross, while he was in that situation, supported his mother who was suffering the greatest loss of her life at that moment. And so he made sure that she would have someone to care for her after his departure. Even though he was given little support, he supported others in that moment. So Jesus modeled support, and it was support that made a difference. And we're his followers today, and what an example we have to follow. Do you know what a grove is? I married one. Tracy was a grove, but that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, where does where does that word grove come from? Uh, there's an author named Carl Connor who told a story that that I hope will help us think about that. I just want to share a few of his words about it. 
He wrote, a few winters back, we had a number of extremely heavy snows in Forsyth County area of North Carolina. Between Winston-Salem and Kernersville along Interstate 40 were several large groves of tall, young pine trees. Following one of the six-inch wet snows, the pine branches were bowed down with the weight of the heavy snow. The thick grove of trees looked like a picture out of a storybook. In addition to the groves of pines, a good many trees stood alone in the more sparsely wooded area next to the interstate. Without the protection of being able to lean against one another, many of the beautiful trees broke off and fell to the ground. However, the trees that were in groves bent under the load of the snow, leaning against one another. In the thick groves, none of the pines were broken. And he finishes by saying, I was reminded of the importance of standing together in the time of storm. There is strength in leaning against one another. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about support. I want us to look for a few minutes at an example of support from Scripture. And it may at first seem like an odd example, but but I believe there are some really good things here for us. It requires that we return to the story of Job. We've talked a, quite a bit about Job um, in recent weeks here, had a couple of sermons on Job, and then our young adults on Sunday morning are studying the book of Job. And, uh, just a great book. And, you know, if any human being ever needed support, it was this ancient man by the name of Job to whom a, bio, a book in, in your Old Testament is devoted. You remember that um, as the story begins, Job had it all. He was rich and famous. He had a great family. And on top of all of that, he was a very righteous man, so much so that he was called the greatest man in the East. And so much so that Satan decided that he was going to try and make a test case out of Job. Satan went before God and requested permission to reach into Job's life and take away everything that was precious to him in the hopes of proving that Job, bereft of his blessings, would turn away from God. God, of course, allowed this, and, and so we have this incredible book called Job, that tells the story. So Job, the guy who had everything, quickly loses everything, even his own health. And in the complete shock of all of this, Job finds himself in a desperate situation. He finds himself in deep mourning. He is as low as he could be. He has lost family and wealth and respect. And he's probably thinking that he has even lost God. And so Job says things like this. He says on one occasion, Cursed be the day that I was born. And he says, Why didn't I just die at birth? He just cannot understand why God would allow this kind of thing to happen to him. So Job, of all people, needs support. He needs someone to lean on. He needs people to gather around him and bear his burdens. And he gets that from three friends. Now, before we look at what they did, at the end of chapter 2 of the book, I want us, of course, to remember what they do in the rest of the book of Job. Remember, Job's a long book. It's 42 chapters. And the bulk of that is a series of dialogues that are recorded between Job and his friends. We might call them, more accurately, arguments. And in most all of that, the friends of Job are really not supportive at all. 
Job, in fact, calls them miserable comforters. And they were exactly that. They accuse him. They rebuke him. They, they basically put Job and his character and his morality on trial. And so they argue and they harangue and they debate. And folks, none of that is support. But before all that takes place, there is a brief period where Job's friends help him. Where they really support him. And it's actually before anyone opens their mouths. Before anything is said by anyone. Isn't that interesting? That when they helped him, it was when they were quiet. We sometimes struggle with what to say to a person who is suffering, who is in need of our support. And we think because, because, you know, we, because we think that we, we have to say something and we don't know what to say, we don't go. But in the story of Job, the only time the friends are helpful is when their mouths are shut. Now keep that in mind. Let's read three verses in Job chapter 2, beginning verse 11 of Job 2. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they each came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. As I said before, this is not the way we normally think of Job's friends here. That we usually remember their harsh accusatory words. And, and then Job's sort of pleading responses to those words. But here in these precious few verses, we see the good that they could do. We see real support. So what had happened? News of this series of terrible things that had struck Job finally reach his friends from a distance. And they respond appropriately. And so Elphaz and, and Bildad and Zophar, the friends, make an appointment, the text says, to come together to see Job. And, and it says that their purpose in doing so was to show him sympathy. And to comfort him. I think here we have Job's friends at their best. You don't have to read very much further to see them at their worst. But here they're at their best. Four things they do. And that would be the lesson for us today. First, they come to show him sympathy. Now this is not the kind of sympathy that you show by sending a Hallmark card or a bouquet of flowers. The word here in the text is very strong, and it's, it's the kind of showing of sympathy that can only be shown in the presence of the one who is suffering. In other words, they had to go. They had to be there with Job to do this, and they made a plan together to do, to do that. They scheduled a time, and they came as a group of friends to show Job they cared about what was happening to him. This word, it's a fascinating word. Sometimes it has the idea 
of a, of a physical expression, a kind of swaying or nodding that is a physical expression of mourning. You see, it's a sympathy so powerful that is expressed in a physical way. In verse 12, the friends, upon seeing Job's awful condition, they're moved to tears. And they tear their clothes and they throw dust into the air. Those are all common physical signs in that world, in that ancient time of mourning. And it's also still done in that part of the world today to express mourning. But the way the Bible describes it here, I think it's much more than just a custom or a habit that the friends perform. I, I think the Bible intends for us to see the, the, the deep feeling here, the true emotion, the, the sincere mourning. Job needed that from his friends, and they supported him in that way. That's number one. But the Bible also says in verse 11, secondly, that they came to comfort Job, to comfort him. Now, this is, uh, this is different from the previous word. It's, again, a very strong word in the original. With this word, to comfort means more than just to sympathize. It means to encourage. Now, we remember this word from a famous verse that you all can quote this morning from Psalm 23, where David writes the following of God. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Same word that's used here describing what the friends did for Job. More than, than just a showing of sympathy, it's offering the sufferer courage to go on. It's being strong for them when they are weak. Not being strong in the sense that we don't cry. Not a tough guy kind of strong. That is a total misunderstanding. It's being strong in the sense that we are a source of strength to them. We do things for them that they no longer have the strength to do. We lift them up. We truly bear their burdens. That's how you comfort someone that's in crisis. And that's what Job's friends plan to do for him. The third thing that Job's friends did to support him was that they identified with Job where he was. Now, at first, according to verse 12, when they saw him from a distance, they didn't even recognize him. They had never seen him like this. Job was a great man, a man of influence, a, a spiritual man, but when his friends came, Job was a shell of that man. He, he was sitting on a heap of ashes. He was deathly ill, both physically and spiritually. And one of the best things that Job's three friends did was to join him on that ash heap. They went where Job was. They sat where Job sat. They cried. They tossed ashes into the air and upon their heads. They tore their clothes. Brothers and sisters, even today, we can't truly support people in their time of need if we don't go where they are. Simple presence speaks more loudly than anything else. And then, finally, the, the best thing, I'm convinced, that Job's friends did to support him 
was to keep their mouths closed. That may seem strange, but it's true. Job's friends don't get into trouble until they start talking. Until they start explaining things to Job. And telling Job where he was wrong. And so forth. Oh, what a terrible mistake to try to do that for a person in the midst of suffering. Folks, just go and be quiet. Go and support. It is not a time to teach or to rebuke or to correct or or to try to share some great deep wisdom of explanation. You notice most of the time funeral homes are quiet. This is the reason. That is appropriate for a person who's hurting. Job's friends notice what they do. They come and sit with him in silence for seven full days. And no one spoke a word. For they saw that his suffering was great. When my own father died of a horrible disease, At a relatively young age, my exact age now, as a matter of fact, it's hard to believe. But when he died, a lot of people came to the funeral home. A lot of people said a lot of things to my mother and and to my sister and to me. And I remember almost nothing of what people said. I remember maybe one or two things and it's because those one or two things were inappropriate. But a lot of people said a lot of things. I don't remember what they said. But I remember that people came. I remember some who came that I knew traveled multiple hours. just to spend a few minutes in our presence, in our suffering. That is real support. That is what people need when they're in need. One time there was a a choral concert. High school choral was performing And the plan was for the group to sing a very familiar piece. And uh, at one point, the lead tenor in the group was to have a solo. Well, it was a bad day for that young tenor. He started his solo off key and out of rhythm. And things very quickly went from bad to worse as he tried to adjust in mid-solo. No one's ever asked me to sing a solo, so I don't know what that's like, but I can imagine. Something very beautiful soon happened, though. Seeing that the young man was in trouble, the audience began to sing along with him. And his fellow choir members joined in as well. And after a few seconds, the tenor figured out his mistake and corrected his pitch. And, and the sound of the audience and the choir now joined together was beautiful. It was outstanding. And then as they came to the last verse of the intended solo, the audience and the choir dropped out. And that one solo tenor voice remained. And he sang the most beautiful solo of his life. That is a picture of real support. Coming alongside another person who is in trouble, joining them where they are, encouraging them along, and eventually seeing them restored to their place. 
Folks, can we do that for each other in the body of Christ? We certainly can. We can do it for each other, and we can do it for others out there who are in need. In fact, we have resources in Christ that no one else has. We have the ultimate comfort living within us, the Holy Spirit of God. So let's learn how to show real support, and then as opportunities arise, Let's go out and do it. Let's pray together. Loving Father, you have always been such a strength for us and a support for us. And we wish to be godly people and do that for others. Help us to learn your wisdom from your word that reminds us and, and teaches us how to be good support, real support to one another. We thank you this morning that you called us to this place, this time, and we pray you have been praised and that we will be strengthened and go out and share good news with others. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus. We pray in his name today. Amen. Thank you for supporting me by listening kindly this morning. As we sing this song that Tom will come and lead, maybe you're in need of help and support. Maybe you're in need of, of calling on the name of the Lord to be saved, obeying the gospel of Jesus today. We would love to baptize you into Christ if that's the case. Maybe you need to come back to him. Whatever the need, if it needs to be taken care of publicly, um, we're going to invite you to come as we sing. But if it needs to be taken care of privately, please seek us out and let us know. Let's stand and sing this. Live for Jesus, oh my brother, in his life.